Okay. Um, well, um, welcome everyone. Um, I'm hoping that uh, other members of the group will uh, join, uh, or will at least look at the recordings um, between now and the last meeting, which is uh, when I'll be um, asking us all to brainstorm and think about where to go from this point. Uh, but I'll be sending out a series of questions before then. So it's my huge pleasure because I keep hearing about Rene Matthew in, in all the previous talks and, and from interactions with people on email. So a huge pleasure to welcome Rene Matthew, who's one of our leading consultants on co-housing and has been responsible for 11 co-housing projects, as well as being right up to her neck in one at the moment. So who better? than to uh, provide us with an overview. Um, she will be sharing her slides with us afterwards. Um, and uh, there'll be lots of questions that you will both raise and respond to. So thank you, Renee. <clears throat> well, th thank you very much for inviting me to do a presentation. Um, I'm really uh, uh, pleased to actually have that opportunity. So I'm going to jump right in. Uh, and share my screen. So, uh, yeah, so just um, wanting to start this with uh, basically the talk that I was asked to, to uh, provide was practical steps to creating co-housing. And um, I thought that starting with a quote from a um, group that I had worked with in the past, um, would be a great way to, to start this, where one of the Keyside members said, when I took stock a year or two after moving in, I thought to myself, if I'd written down all the things I would like in a place to live, it wouldn't have been nearly as good as this. And that's a Keyside Village member. And I would say that um, that applies to me as well. I have been living in co-housing now for more than 20 years and even though I wasn't too sure about it when I first moved in whether I would be able to uh, whether whether it would be right for me I can't imagine another place to live a better way to live so I would say in my opinion it's worth the effort so I'll get in and say you know what that effort takes so uh well, let's see um so what is you know, who am I? Basically, um, I am the president of Closing Development Consulting, uh, CDC, which is a small full service incorporated consulting company that's been providing closing development management services to groups um, since 1996. And so to date, we've managed the development of 11 communities in Canada, three of which are senior focused. And interestingly, the three senior focused communities, um, they're the only senior communities right now in Canada. Um, so uh, I think that's interesting. Um, and so what is it that supports groups to succeed? a clear and concrete shared objective. So I'll be talking about that a little bit more, but that is a really important starting place, is knowing where you want to go. A willingness to let go of personal attachments in the best interest of the group. So this is a group process. There are, everybody comes in with their own ideas about what it is that they want, but Basically, you need to find a way to be able to move into the group um, and basically come with what is in the best interest of our larger collective. You also need a realistic perspective of what is possible. Very often groups fail because they don't have a clear understanding of what it is that it's gonna take to make the project happen. You need to know when to engage experienced professionals because it's we're, we live in a complex world where it's very challenging to do a housing development without professional. You're going to need some professionals. So it's a matter of knowing when to do that so that you don't waste time and money. You need to have the legal and financial structures in place that will attract the money needed to make the project happen. Now, 
there it's a constantly changing world and we don't know you know until you start getting into it um, what exactly that is going to look like but you need to be sure before you decide what your legal structure is going to be that you can actually make it work from a financial perspective and you need an organizational and decision making process to support community connection as well as an effective collaborative process whatever that looks like I'm most familiar with consensus decision-making, but there's other models that you can use, sociocracy being one of them. And so what are the main ingredients for making this happen? As I mentioned, the vision, project objective, you need members who are willing to put in the time and energy and who have the capacity to make the project happen. And they need to have time. You need to be able to spend time. If you want to do a development like this, it, it's going to take time. You need to have land. That's very key. And I think as a group here, you've got, uh, my understanding is you've got great potential for that. So that's a huge benefit because some groups spend years looking for an appropriate site. So that has an opportunity for you that is um, going to give you a real um, leg up in getting the project going if you choose to do that. As I mentioned before, you need professionals who know how to do this, who have development experience that can guide you in a way that will support you to successfully uh, make your project happen. And financial money needs to come from somewhere and you need to know where it's coming from. And it happens that the projects that I am uh, have, have managed, most of the money has come from the members as well as a financial institution um, that has been willing to, to finance the construction. Um, and there's ways for uh, to, to generate finances that contributes to creating affordability for the members that contribute financially to the project. Um, but there, it may be that you have, that there's other ways to set up the finances, but you need to figure out how that's going to work. That's, that's a very key piece. And so in, as I mentioned, in the projects that I have worked on, um, the money has come from the members where they were willing to, to and able to make take some financial risk to, to get the process moving forward. Now, I think regardless of what financial structure you use, there's going to need to be some money that gets spent by members. There needs to be a willingness to put some money in the project. And so for the projects that I worked on, the way that it worked was um, the members were directors of the company with one share per household. They contributed shareholder loans, which then converted towards the purchase price at completion. Very simple structure, um, but that was the way that it worked. Now, whether or not that's the financial structure that you're going to use, I'm just giving it as an example of a simple financial structure that has worked well for the projects that, that I've been involved in. And, you know, interestingly, we've never had difficulty generating the money that was required to make the projects happen. Um, the typical steps involved, you need to get started. You need to build a strong foundation. You need to set up a development corporation and what that development corporation looks like will depend on um, many things, but you'll need help from knowledgeable professionals in order to make sure that you've got something that works well. You need community organization and membership, efficiency, effectiveness, and connection. <laughs> because if you're gonna be working together as a group, one of the things that makes co-housing work mm -hmm. is the fact that people feel connected to each other, that they want to work together, that they want to connect, they want to share meals together, they want to do things together. And so there needs to be an, an organizational structure that supports that in the development process. It's what creates the culture that supports co-housing to then um, 
after you've moved in to continue with that culture. There's actually been experiments where they've done, um, you know, co-housing inspired design and had a bunch of people move in who didn't know each other and they didn't use the common spaces because they didn't have a desire to do the level of connection. So there's a real, um, creating connection is a key piece. You need to secure a site and in securing a site, you're taking a leap. Basically, once you've secured a site, you are, you, you've basically, you've, you've started the process. You need to then um, take it from there, especially if you've put money down. You need to then do design and development, as I say, make it real. That's a whole process of the group working together. Um, with your you know, ideals and desires and um, making sure that you uh, incorporate that into your design. Construction, get it built. There needs to be a way to um, make that work for you. There's a lot of different models that you can use for construction. And, and it, 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 will, it depends on the circumstances, which is the best model for you, but that's, um, the next stage. And then last stage is completion. Uh, move in and celebrate, you know, your great achievement. And um, groups do. It's, it's a big celebration at the end of this, this process. So what do you do to get started? Um, this is the things that I have found works the best. You need to educate yourself about the concept, which is what you're doing right now. That is, you know, um, obviously part of what you're doing need to reach out to your network. So, you know, who are people that might be interested in this that you uh, would would enjoy having a, as a neighbor? Um, I think it's really important early on to name the project. Now, you know, you may change your name um, at some point in time, you know, even like fairly soon after, but but having a name gives you, it starts to give you a, a, a ground in reality. This is, this is we, we're real, we're, we're, this is us, you know, and there's lots of groups that have changed their name. It, it gets harder the longer that you've had the project going to change your name because, you know, you, typically people want to make consensus about that and that's a real aesthetic decision, but um, identify a core group, which it sounds like that's, um, you know, the stage that you're you're starting to move into based on my bit of conversation um, before the, the meeting started. And, and um, you need to identify who's willing to take the time, um, spend some money, expend the energy to bring the project to completion, uh, or at least get it started. And, to, you know, to open up a bank account, um, and my recommendation always is to, you know, do very informally at the early stages because you don't, you want to keep your costs as low as possible. So there's ways of setting it up so that it's more of an informal organization, but you need to be able to generate some money because there's going to be some expenses that are going to come down if you really want to make the project happen. You need to determine a meeting strategy, which I think that you probably, it looks like you've already got a, a, a sense of that, you know, in terms of timeline and that sort of thing. But, you know, looking at what is it that we need to do? Who do we need to talk about? When do we want to include new people? Um, that sort of thing. Um, having a communication and document management system, you need to be able to keep, keep track of the decisions that you've made um, of, of things that you've done. That's pretty obvious. Establish preliminary decision-making protocols and practices. You know, um, I know some consultants have very clear ideas of the kind of decision-making protocols and practices I, I certainly do that I like to work on, work with groups. So I, I, I recommend that you don't get too attached to this, that you don't get, do too much uh, work on this right now, but it, you really, you need to be making decisions. And so you need to have a way where everybody is in alignment with how you're gonna make decisions and who makes those decisions and how that works. Developing a statement of shared intention, which we talked about before. You basically need to have your decision-making protocol in place in order to make sure that you know, you've know you got that nailed down. 
determine your site criteria, which you probably don't need to do, and research potential site locations, which it sounds like that's not necessary for you. Collecting preliminary financial information, you know, um, part of establishing feasibility is identifying uh, what the members can afford and where the money money is going to come from. And that really, th those two things go hand in hand. And then determining a strategy for selection of the professionals team. Like, what is it that you want to do to identify who it is that's going to help you to make this project happen? Um, and so... Basically, you know, I, I think that that I've said it in, in a nutshell here, um, you know, CDC can offer workshops like one we have, which is a, a standard workshop, introductory workshop on Zoom, what it takes to develop a co-housing project. Cost is 500 for up to 20 participants and 20 for each additional participant to a maximum of, of 40. You know, if you wanted to do something more custom, then we could see what that would look like if you were interested in doing that. But I'm interested in working with groups um, at this stage, basically to support them to make their projects happen. Um, but I'm not doing full project management anymore. So I'm more supporting groups to find the professionals, to know what it is that it takes, and to support them to get their project grounded so that they can move forward with it. So. As I said, in the end there, we'd be happy to help you get started on the right foot. So, <laughs> so that's basically the presentation. So I'm uh, open to any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in, in the uh, preliminary questions or discussion we were having just before we started, um, one of the points you made was about um, certain uh, misunderstandings about the relative costs of co-housing and co-op housing and, and maybe you can repeat what you said about that. I yeah, I'd be happy to. So so co-housing is not a particular legal structure. Co-housing can be a whole variety of legal structures. There's a co-housing group actually in Ontario that's uh, set up as uh, its soul sisters where they set up as a corporation and everybody just uh, or as a uh, it's not a corporation but where they basically just have shared ownership. And they all have a percentage of the share of the ownership as if you, you know, own a single family house and share it together. Um, mm -hmm. So it can be anything from that. It can be a co-op structure. It can be a strata structure. The reason why the strata is one that, you know, I have favored in working with the groups and the groups have favored is because it's been the easiest one to finance. So with co-ops right now, I'm aware that there's uh, government incentives to do co-ops. And so if you can secure funding for that, then there may be a very good rationale to do the project as a co-op. But just to be aware that co-housing is more about the lifestyle choice. It's a choice of people wanting to be connected with each other and having um, Part of the definition is that you have individual homes where you've got a full kitchen, but where you've got extensive shared spaces that support you to have an interdependent relationship with your neighbors that supports you to be in more connection with them. So questions. Sorry, I'm not visible, but I I do have a question. Um, in your experience, what what range of size of um, community? You know, how how many is the minimum number of people that have got something like this off the ground, and what's the maximum? Can you give us some sense of that? Well, yeah, there's there's no like co housing can be any any size really, but there's sizes that are most optimum. And so mm -hmm. the most optimum size is somewhere around, you know, 20 to 30 households. 
because what that does is it allows for enough um, energy in the enough financial energy as well as energy in the community to support the common spaces and to support people to be able to move in and out of relationship with the larger community. The smaller the community is, the more, um, uh, I guess, responsibility that each individual member has to contribute. In a larger community, you can have, it, it's that because there's more energy there, you can have people um, who, you know, take on particular roles, but not as much responsibility um, as, say, if there's four households, for example, then you have much more work that you have to do to maintain your building because you've basically, there's only four of you. Whereas if you've got a community of, of 30 households, there's a lot more people to, you can, you know, have a, a, a subcommittee of four or five people who do that. Um, so, that really ends up being the, the sweet spot. And there's definitely some communities that are smaller and larger than that, you know. Um. Thank you. I picked up on a point earlier too, um, when you were saying that uh, uh, the three senior co-housing developments you were involved in, which were the only ones in Canada, what was different about them from the other co-housing um, projects? Well, so the, the main, the, what none of them are age restricted. They okay. have all said any age can move in here if they are uh, attracted to this. But they are senior focused. They're focusing on the aging in place. What happens in the intergenerational communities, um, which it's not children take up space and you know um they they require energy to support them to be part of the community nothing wrong with that if you want to have children in the community but um they do tend to take priority when it's an intergenerational community that just mm -hmm. it just tends to work that way in a senior focused community the elders are definitely priority. And so I'm just, I'm in very close contact with my good friend, Margaret Critchlow, who lives at um, Harborside Co-Housing in Souk. And she was the founding member there. We've actually, we've written a book together and we're getting close to being ready to publish it. Um, but I'm, because I'm very connected with what's, uh, with her and what's going on there, they're doing all kinds of discussions about co-care, how to support people to age well in community. They're, they, uh, I, I was given this, a deck by a friend of mine here at Cranberry Commons called the Death Deck. And they're actually having coffee circles where they're playing the, with the Death Deck to talk about what it is that people see for aging and eventual death um, and how they want to be supported in that way. You can have those kind of conversations for sure in an intergenerational community, but they tend to be more likely in a senior focused community. And um, in all of those cases, the community developed common spaces that were specifically designed for their aging process. And all of them have the opportunity for a caregiver suite in the event that the community decides that they want to have, you know, some kind of communal support system there in order to be able to stay there uh, through to, uh, you know, a time when you need care. Yeah. Okay. I see Ruth has her hand up. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, this may be more of a question for, for Sneeja and the group, but last time I was here, I wasn't aware that you had a serious um, bead on a, a piece of land, and that would be very exciting. I was just wondering uh, if you could say, say anything about that. Uh, not very much. What the hope is that we're submitting um, this project or the request for this project to UBC um, planning process. And uh, the way that we're hoping it's going to work uh, is that uh, it becomes part of the 
the planning process that uh, UBC is envis envisioning, which is very much about turning uh, that whole area into, it's, it's sort of behind it is the idea of turning that whole area into its own little village. And uh, obviously retirees would be part of what should be in that village for all kinds of reasons. So that's the idea. Oh. That's the idea. And is it going to be women only, or is it sort of like what Rane was saying, women focused? Um, you know, that's a, it's an interesting. I, I doubt it, but it's interesting to me because that's part of what has galvanized me because I'm so aware of women, uh, retired women, having fewer resources, uh, even in the academic world. Um, which supposedly is more equitable, but we know it's not. <laughs> uh, the stats are there. Uh, what interests me is that when we look at the, even the illustrations that Renee was using, but that most of the speakers have used, there is a preponderance of women in those co-housing groups. Mm -hmm. And um, from talking to people, I don't know how much research there has been into that. Why do women dominate that particular field? And what what are the implications for that? That's that's a big question for me. You know, I, I have to say, I, uh, the 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 projects that I've worked on, um, the founding members, I, I you know I should should think about that, but most of them have been women, hmm. and I think that it's because of the collaborative nature, cooperative, um, supportive, interdependent you know, way of thinking, which I think is a little more, you know, whether you're male or female, in the feminine archetypal um, realm. And so, you know, the, the men that were involved were people that valued all of those things as well, that were valuing collaboration, cooperation, connection, as opposed to, you know, our you know, common societal uh, mm -hmm. values that, that we have. So, um, yeah, and, and something that, that comes up for me in this is that another thing that people uh, maybe might want to be aware of is, is that the, the, the core group to get the project started, I was looking back on all of the projects. I'm actually doing a summary of all of the 11 projects, and it's been a little bit of archival <laughs> digging for me. But to see how many people were in the founding member group, and it ranged from, you know, about five to eight. So you don't, very often, the, the founding group is, is not that large. Um, and, you know, you're, 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 you're basically setting a tone, that group, for what the project is going to be. And it's a mistake to try to be too inclusive. <laughs> Interesting mm -hmm. thing. Um, that was one of the things that it was, uh, there's a group in Nova Scotia um, called um, uh, Treehouse Eco Village. They're under construction right now, and they were really struggling um, at one point, you know, quite a number of years ago, and I didn't have time to work with them, but I had a meeting with them, and I said, you need to create a box. Uh, that's the way that, well, I mean, that's the way they described what I said. You need to define yourself. What is it that you're doing? Because they were being way too, people were coming and going, and they were just letting everyone who showed up to have an input, and, you know, they just, they didn't know who they were. And they weren't able to attract people because if they didn't know who they were, how could they attract people who would be interested in being with them? And so when they realized that and really got down and that's the project objective that I'm talking about and nailed that down, and it was a smaller group. They attracted people then, you know, they're, they're sold out, you know, they're under construction. Um, they're, you know, making it happen. Um, mm. But if you take a look at her, uh, um, you know, she, she, they, they worked with sociocracy, which really helped them to create a structure for decision making. Um, that, uh, that that's really what you need in decision making is a structure. It doesn't have to be a particular structure, just one that supports connection. <laughs> um, doesn't have to be something in particular, but yeah, what they um, actually have been very successful with sociocracy, which is. Uh, Good to see another forum too. Anyway, I don't want to 
go on too long there. So do other people want to come in on that? Because one of the slightly um, other element that I think made me wonder about the preponderance of women was that the the old models for aging, which were of the burden of care often falls on women, um, is one that really does not work. Uh, the atomization, the privatization of that care were increasingly, uh, even in people, you know, that are relatively well off. Nonetheless, the burden falls on women uh, to have that, you know, one-on-one -on -one care for a partner something like that and and this is about sharing that so it's part of i think the aging profile but i i'd love to hear from what others have to say about that it, um so allison i yeah i think this idea of who we would be and who would be included for better lack of a better term would have to be nailed down pretty soon mm -hmm. uh, um, if we're you know that's my feeling anyway like what what do we want um, who do we want to be around and um uh, I think for I think I I have a question about the the whole aging in place and that, which is something that very much appeals to me personally. So, but you talked about resources in terms of energy and you know people to take various roles and get work done and that type of thing. Um, I imagine there's some differences between communities. With, that are specifically designed for aging in place versus those that have a, a wider range of ages and from the energy perspective. Wondering if you want to say anything about, if anybody wants to talk about that. <laughs> Interestingly, it's the elders actually that do most of the work most of the time. <laughs> the people with the young kids don't have time. Uh, so, yeah, they might be out and shovel the sidewalks, you know. Um, they do a good job with that for sure. Um, but they aren't the ones that show up and do the work of actually administering things and uh, that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, there's always a range, right, of capacities, and, and that's where the slightly larger group allows for, um, you know, the range. You know, there's some people who love to cook, for example, and that's the contribution <laughs> that they make um, to the community is they're, they're, they're cooking. And there's some people who like to manage finances, you know, and so that's the contribution that they make. So that the, 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 it's a, there's a variety of contributions that can be made. And, you know, we had a, a member of our community who has since passed, um, but she was in her late nineties when she passed and she continued to contribute in different ways in the, and she enjoyed contributing um, until there came a point where she no longer had the health to, and then she had social capital <laughs> and people were contributing to support her, you know, so there were people bringing meals and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, you know, she took care of things like, you know, the guest room, for example, she made sure that the, all the, the towels were in there and, you know, that and when they needed to be replaced, you know, she would let the community know about that and, you know, that sort of thing. And so there's, there's little things that, that, uh, that she did that, that always, and she did our tours for many, many years. Um, so I think that in, you know, I'm thinking about Margaret's community, which is very much senior focused. There's, they're struggling right now. There's a, there's a couple who um, she ended up all of a sudden having quite severe dementia and he was the caretaker and now he's really struggling because he doesn't actually have the ability to um, deal with that and they have a fund though that they've created and so as a community they're working on how to support those to to stay in the community by contributing um, you know, financial resources that has been, you know, it's part, it, 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 
it's something that the, that the whole community owns because of the way they actually ended up getting some CMHC financing that they put towards affordable housing. And then they have a way, uh, a fund that they've created for this. So that's the sort of thing in a senior focused community that you can, um, if that's part of your vision, that you can actually you know, work into your process. Because there, there comes a point, obviously, when we're aging, where we can no longer participate. And so then we rely on, you know, uh, on other means. And, you know, we can't expect our neighbors to pull the whole load. Neighbors can only do so much. So how to, you know, make sure that you've got that, that balance. That's part of the, the conversation. And just going back to the thing about who you want to be in your group. I'm a real believer and now, you know, not everybody agrees with me, but I really like the idea of self-selection where you clearly define yourself. And if people are attracted to you, they're mm. right. Mm. Um, rather than trying to create some kind of a process where there's an interview and you decide whether, you know, you want the person part of the community. That's just my particular um Different people have different perspectives on this, but that's my perspective, that the more clearly you define yourself, the more likely you're going to attract the type of people who are going to be right for your, your community. Thank you. Um, other questions? Um, I'm, I've got a, do we have a, there's noises? Oh. Um, I do have a question for you. Is this everyone's muted? Uh, I do have a question for you, Renee, because you're so experienced and you've worked over, you know, quite a number of different projects. Were there surprises for you? I mean, what were there the surprises where you thought, oh, you know, that was unexpected? Was there any moments like that? Always. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, there's, there's like every project had something that came up that um, was a challenge or a surprise. There's, 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 there's always something. And so part of what um, I have really learned to value is how a um, group of people who are, are, are have the, the good of the group at mind how creative they can be at solving problems and dealing with challenges things that come up that you know we weren't necessarily expecting or <clears throat> that uh, have have appear to have been a, a roadblock obstacle and it is what has given me optimism about our future as a species actually is uh, working together uh, with people and and finding ways and, you know it's not always easy and sometimes you know we don't always like each other in the mm. process um, but I think if we maintain that that we're going to stay in it and we're going to figure it out will help us you know we we can I think we have a great capacity for finding solutions Any more questions? I'm kind of curious about something else and uh, would think that, you know, maybe we would, this is something we want to dialogue about, but, you know, we're all academic. So we, we have lived in a culture of very structured meetings and probably many of us are comfortable with that. We're also, you know, have worked in a, very diverse with very diverse people so maybe that's an advantage I'm, I'm wondering if amongst the group what people see would be the pros and cons of of having done our spent our working lives in the academic setting that, that we've experienced and just it, it's just something I've been sort of mulling over and thinking how would that affect how we we come together as a group, define ourselves, operate uh, the structures that we create. And I'd kind of be interested to hear from other people about 
their thoughts on that. Does anyone want to jump in? Um, diversity is something that is absolutely at the front of my concerns because um, I, I don't, I haven't seen the makeup of uh, many of the groups, but from those that I have seen, diversity is not obvious as much as one can tell just from, uh, you know, looking at photographs of people. But it's something that precisely, given the community we're part of, uh, should be kind of right there in the centre. And it would certainly be very much part of my priorities would be to have that. So that's one thing. Hmm. Others? Um, I, I think um, it's Christina speaking here. Um, being part of the academic community, but as an administrator and not as an academic myself, um, I just want to offer the observation that there is an academic culture. So even though a photograph, and you might have professors from all over the world, they all, they're all part of that academic culture. So you, academia does have a common culture and, and it's, it's obvious to me and, and it's pretty well defined and it's very hierarchical and patriarchal. So I, I <laughs> yeah. And so I've often, you know, it's, it's occurred to me like, wow, the, you know, as Allison said, you know, meetings are run in a certain way. And I, I've, I've been around co-housing groups and it's quite different. You know, a co-housing meeting to me is quite a different animal to a typical academic meeting. So, yeah, I, I have the same question, Alison. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it can be hard to get out of those habits of adhering to quite, you know, uh, <laughs> rigid structures for meetings and things like that. I mean, I notice even in, in my strata council for myself wanting to, to, you know, not so much have a, a meeting where people chat on and on, but, but, you know, get on with the decision-making type of thing. So, uh, you know, I think that would be perhaps something we would want to define about ourselves but would also require um, us to consciously be aware of our need to shift uh, how we how how we talk to each other. Even I don't know that that's just some thoughts I had, and kind of as I mull this all over. Um, all I can say is that um, if you've been involved in uh, varieties of women's studies, as I have been for decades, um, those models get uh, examined very early. So there are areas, even in our academic structures, oh, Christina, um, in our academic structures, where people have actually played around with that and opened them up and torpedoed them and whatever else <laughs> and come up with um, different ways of doing things. So... Um, there are areas of expertise about doing that, um, destabilizing that in good ways um, that we can look to um, within the academic structure. And that's one area. Um, yeah. And, and I, I think I, I agree it can be done, but there has to be an awareness and a desire to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. And the other thing that occurred to me when you were talking, Ruth, about... Um, uh, not Ruth, Renee, sorry. Renee, when you were talking about um, the things that are necessary for elder care, if if um, we um, succeed in, in building something like this as part of the UBC community, one of the, and it's an ambiguous kind of uh, pleasure that we have is that we're surrounded by, you know, expertise, gerontology departments, um, uh, psychology, psychiatry, various kinds of medical um, research uh, that we can be willing guinea pigs for. So even the intractable, it appears you know, to us, um, kind of fear of dementia, 
dementia is from what I've had to do with it because of dealing with a partner um, in the past. Dementia is it's a much more complex field than one imagines in, in general kind of discussion. So exploring these fields and contributing to their complexity is something that's built into. That's one of the good sides of being surrounded by academic expertise of that kind that that for um, you know for obvious reasons aging populations all over the world this is very much an area of growth that one would be smack bang in the middle of and contributing to and that's that's a very interesting and it's not it's not just the, the responsibility of one community it's actually part of the whole kind of texture of of the area and and that I can potentially be quite exciting I can definitely see that um, being a value. And really, one of the things about um, a group of people who are in co-housing and have created the housing for themselves, they've taken responsibility for their circumstances and where what they're what they're doing. And that can be very enticing for, you know, working as a professional with them because you've got this group of of people that you can actually have conversations with about what will work and that have thought about it and have ways of making decisions that will support them to do that in it. You know, I was just thinking about what Christine was saying about the um, causing groups feeling quite different. And it's not that we don't have structure. We actually have a lot of structure in when we're making decisions and that sort of thing. It's just that it's a structure that's intended to support um, people to be able to speak they what what it is that they they want to say to like being open to the diversity and there's a lot more diversity than what it looks like <laughs> you look at I, I imagine yes. <laughs> uh, so diversity can sometimes be really challenging actually it's easier to make decisions when there isn't diversity really um so yeah anyways that's just uh but it um it's just about you know being open to hearing each other and then you know what I had said in one of the things that it takes is the willingness and ability to let go that's a really important piece that if we can't let go of our perspective on something then it, it we're not going to be able to find that collaborative connective place we need to be able to hear what others are saying and and be open to it and let go of our own perspective um so that's a, that's an important part and and one of the things i think quite you know in the academic world people are used to um being the ones who know and so they have a particular perspective of knowing um that sometimes can be um impact the ability to be open uh let's just say it that way <laughs> Mm. You said it very nicely, Renee. Mm. I know it myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you get a room full of academics and they're all experts in something. So well, but I'm an expert too, experts. right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're not experts in everything. But I'm not always open to the <laughs> what it is. <laughs> But not necessarily knowledgeable about what aging means. That's the thing. That's yeah. the thing. And the other, the other thing that, that I've become aware of recently, because of various kinds of assessments of manuscripts and so on, I've been doing is that one of the growth areas, and it's not a surprise, is um, in very interesting ways and not just instrumentalist ways, the growth of uh, art therapy. So using art as a way of opening people up to different kinds of knowledge. That is really a growing field all over the world, it seems. And that's very interesting, the sorts of things that are developing there. And I imagine that, um, because I know with discussions I've had amongst others with you, Christina, that we were talking about the importance of having one common space being a space for practicing all kinds of art, um, that that would be an important component. 
And interestingly, all the senior co-housing communities have art rooms. So, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's a mm -hmm. part of someone who, you know, if she has the time or energy, uh, you know, capacity um, that would, I think you would enjoy hearing from her if you're wanting to uh, talk more about aging uh, well in community is Margaret Critchlow, um, who yes. was the founding yeah. member yeah. of yeah. Harborside. She's a... Um, anthropologist professor of anthropology uh emeritus is that how you mm. yeah mm. and uh so and she's just very interested i mean the whole purpose for creating the community from her perspective was to find ways for aging in place and so she's living it and mm. living the experience and living and I'm, I'm sure that there could be some sharing there of ideas um you know as the potential is for seniors communities, I think, uh, um, to share with each other the things that are working and, you know, maybe not working so well um, to improve the, 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 the living um, capacity in, in that kind of environment. On a small scale, one of the things that um, um, I found was extremely helpful was uh, starting a writing group three years ago. It was actually before the pandemic, and it kind of uh, kept us alive during the pandemic. So just a simple thing like writing yeah, yeah. Um, from with people from very different disciplinary backgrounds was incredibly useful, therapeutic, and um, helped help to uh, preserve certain moments of optimism. And that's one of the things I think that you're touching on is the why you would do co-housing. Mm. And, you know, my tendency, my my uh, focus is, is, is how <laughs> to do co-housing. I, I, I The why is definitely part. I mean, I live in co-housing and so and, and love living here. But, you know, the the professional role that I or any anything that I could support you with is is in the how piece. Um, Thank you. So do we have some final questions for Renee? Um, I, uh, it's Isabel here. Um, one thing we uh, haven't talked about, but is obviously absolutely crucial is the financing of uh, projects. Um, how do you begin to go about that in terms of what people contribute and to what at the beginning and can you just give a, a you know, it's a, a complex uh, topic, obviously, but could you give us some sense of what that looks like? Yeah, it, you know, it's not something that I can really talk about in a couple of minutes. Um, it's it's a because it is it's a very big topic um, and there needs to be a financial structure that allows for different levels of participation because people come with different financial capacities and how to make it attractive for people who have the greater financial capacity to actually um, take some larger risk is part of what contributes to making them happen. So where you end up having, um, you know, the more people that are involved in the project the, the, that have the capacity to whatever occupy you know whatever financial structure you have to be able to take on that financial responsibility at the end of the project that helps everybody but there needs to be a way to generate the money to actually make the project happen and how to do that in a way that works for people who have financial capacity to put it in to make it attractive for them to want to put it into the project is basically the uh, it, it, it it's it's a little more complex than what I can talk about here, but it's definitely there's a, there's a way to do this obviously you know um, and most of the t like all of the groups that I've started working with they've had no idea how they were going to make the project happen how they could possibly financially make it happen to start with and so it's it's not hard to figure it out it's just that it, it takes more than like a one minute discussion so that's certainly something I could do a a, a workshop with you um, if you want to do on you know, setting up financial structure, how it works, how, um, what you need for a project for 
uh, to make a project happen, um, I'd be happy to do that. Um, you know, and I, I yeah. So I, 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 that probably didn't help, <laughs> Isabel, um, but it's just that there is there is a way to make this work. Um, Thank you. Any other last question? Well, thank you very much, Renee. And um, I, with your permission, yes, I can send out the, the the slides that you were using so that people can look at them and ponder. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you. And uh, we hope that more of our group um, look at the recording before our next meeting and uh, send me questions and I'll be sending out questions as well. Thank you very much, all of you. Well, thank I you. wish you good luck with yeah. your process and thank yeah, I wish you all the best. Um, we could use more co-housing in our world, I think. It's Absolutely. a good way Absolutely. to live. So good for you for um, actually taking the steps to try to make it happen. I honor you. Thank you.